this is sort of, in some sense, to me, one of the more exciting pieces of the course. Uh, a lot of what I'll talk about is, you know, there's a lot of engineering choices you can make, and people have made many different engineering choices over the year. And one isn't right and the other wrong. It's just a matter of opinion. So we're going to be talking a little bit about what the choices are to be made, and then provide you with some techniques for measuring which choices are best, and then we'll make some specific choices for this course. Uh, and so for the next... Uh, uh, the lectures before spring break and then a couple lectures after spring break, we're going to be bolding together the um, uh, hardware picture for a 32-bit uh, computer. So let's start by building a simple, a very simple computational engine. Um, uh, we'll solely make it programmable so you can sort of see how that works, and then we'll back up and design a much more sophisticated programmable engine uh, for the rest of the lecture. So here what we have is a, uh, what we call a data path, and so it consists of a bunch of elements that you can sort of recognize. There's the, the wires are, are multi-bit signals. Um, I haven't been too careful in this diagram to tell you exactly how wide the signals are, I mean, how many bits of information they carry. Um, but, you know, think of them as being 16 or 32-bit uh, buses that are carrying information around. We have a multiplier unit that can multiply um, two 32-bit numbers. And in this case, the implication is, is that we only save the bottom 32 bits of the result, um, as often happens in a lot of computer multiplication where you get the same width answer. We know in, in, in computing multiplications that the official answer is twice as wide um, uh, as the, the two operands. But uh, often in computer arithmetic, we simply take the, the bottom 32 bits of, the 32, the, of multiplying two 32-bit operands together and call that the answer. And it's sort of up to you to figure out whether there's been an overflow or not in your program. Here's a unit that subtracts one. Uh, these are two what we call load-enabled registers. You can see that in addition to a data input and a Q output and a clock input, they have a separate input called LE, which stands for load enable. And when that signal is high, we actually load a value into the register, a new value. And when the signal is low, we load an old value. The, you know, the register value doesn't change. We actually are ending up loading the register all the time. But internally, what the register looks like is this. Here's the LE signal. It controls a MUX. And when LE is 1, the, the incoming data value is, is uh, routed to the register. And then that's what gets loaded at the rising edge of the clock. Uh, when LE is 0, we actually take the output of the register and reload it with itself. So the net, I mean, even though the actual physical register is loading a new value on its D input every cycle, Depending on the value of the LE register, it can preserve its value from cycle to cycle simply by loading itself with its previous value. Okay, and then we have some multiplexers which are used to choose. So this is what's inside an LE register. You can see that in this diagram, what we've done is we've added another layer of multiplexer uh, to, to pick some values that will be routed into the, to the load-enabled register. Um, and you'll see that muxes are our friend. We're going to use muxes a lot to route values around our data path. So this is what's called a data path because it doesn't really tell you much about what order things happen in, what the sequencing of operations is. This picture is really just telling you what's possible. And you can see that there are four control signals that select the value to be loaded into the B register that determines whether the B register loads or not. And then over here we have a, a select signal, the A cell signal, that selects the value to be loaded into the A register and whether the A register gets loaded or not. And think of it like a little player piano, right? We're going to take a long paper roll and punch holes in it that will control whether or not at any particular moment which of these control signals are asserted. And then clock cycle by clock cycle, we'll slowly move the roll up, you know, we'll scroll it around. And a different sequence, I mean, uh, there'll be a sequence of control signals that gets generated, or you know, one set of values for each clock cycle. And depending on exactly how, what tune we're playing, that will determine what the um, data path does. Okay, so what we'd like to do is to use the data path, we're going to start off with a very simple problem, of using it to compute n times n minus 1, um, uh, like so, and what we'll do is 
we want to have organized the control signals uh, uh, so that it goes through a sequence of four operations. The first one consists of uh, initializing the two register values. Uh, we're going to initialize A to 1 and, and the B register to the value N. We're then going to perform the sequence of operations. We're going to multiply A and B together and load the answer back into A and then subtract one from B and then do one more multiplication. So uh, if you sort of sort out how this, uh, this, this will produce n times 1 here, uh, which gets loaded into A, we subtract uh, 1 from B, so that would give us n minus 1 now in B. And then we finally multiply n times n minus 1 and stick the result in A. So um, that's the sequence of operations. So the, each of these circles represents something we want to do. The arrows represent a sequence. So, uh, and if there's no arrow between two operations, they can happen in any order or perhaps together. Um, so uh, we know how to build a finite state machine to control such a thing. We're going to have a sequence of states that represents the sequence of operations we want to perform. And we'll just arrange for the output signals to be what we need them to be to do what needs to be done. So here I filled in the table. So you can see during cycle zero, the first cycle, uh, we specify the next state of the state machine. And here you can see the state machine really is just going through four states. And when it gets to the fourth state, if you will, the halting state is just going to sit there and, and loop, uh, doing nothing. Uh, you can see down here that, that none of the control signals is asserted, so no values in the data path are being changed. Not, no, the register contents remain un, unaffected because I'm not loading the registers anymore. Um, and so this is sort of represents the end state. But to get there, we're going to go through state 0, state 1, state 2, and state 3, uh, just in sequence. And uh, for each of those states, we specify a particular set of values. So for example, if you look back at your data path, when a, um, the loads enable signal for A, the ALE signal, the thing that controls the MUX, um, is 1. We're selecting a one, the value 1 to stick into the register A. And we actually load the register A because A cell is 1. And similarly, when um, the load enable on B is 1, we're selecting the, the value N to be routed to the input of the B register. And um, since, uh, and then, I'm uh, sorry, when B cell is 0, we're selecting the value N to be routed to the B register. And then when the load enable signal for B is 1, we're going to actually load that register. And so you can sort of uh, see how this sequence of operations is translated directly into a particular combination of control signals which causes that set of operations, the, the data path, to actually execute the specified operations. It's a pretty simple recipe, pretty straightforward. Any questions about that? And I mean, we're going to start complicating it here for a second. But so think of this now as a, a system where, uh, well, so we, we have a, we can basically embed this control table into one of our little FSM implementations, which consists of a ROM, which uh, provides these output values, and a state register that provides the current state number, which is used as the address to look up what the value should be. Okay. Now we notice that some of these operations can actually be performed in parallel. We have, the first two we sort of recognize could be in parallel uh, here. This one is a little bit harder to see in parallel. If you thought of it as a programming language, clearly you want to use B before you decrement it. The idea was to actually multiply 1 times n as our first operation here, the first here in state 1, um, the first time through it. Uh, but if we think a little bit about the hardware works, remember that we're loading the new value into the registers at the end of the clock cycle, right? At the, on the clock edge that separates uh, you know, one clock cycle from the next. And what we can see by looking at this is, in fact, we can do these two operations in parallel, knowing that A and B will change simultaneously. And this reference to B here actually refers to the value of B throughout the cycle, which, and so, you, so this value of B and this value of B are, in fact, the same numeric value. They're both referring to the same sort of numeric contents, the current contents of the register. And then this assignment operator is really saying, at the end of the cycle, please update the register with these newly computed values. And so this hardware actually works fine. I, can, I don't have to think of these as sequential operations. I can do them in parallel. And I've basically adjusted my table now to, to have one fewer states um, and combine some of these operations. And one of the things that's pretty neat about data paths is that you spend some time off in figuring out how to 
uh, use as much of them you know, at, at the same time as possible. That gives, makes your hardware very efficient. And in fact, if you look at the fancy data path that's inside your machine, a large percentage of it is, is sort of in operation all the time. So they're, they're, they're trying to make sure that as many operations happen in parallel as possible in order to get the computation done as quickly as possible.